Good morning, everyone. Sebastian here sitting in Final Control. Hope you're all doing well out there. And I uh, hope you're getting ready for our morning drive. I'll be getting live to Tara and Mark in exactly four minutes. And uh, still a bit cloudy out here this morning, but I don't think we'll uh, get some rain. The weather reports were saying 65% chance of rain yesterday and 35 for today. And we did get a few drops yesterday, but I don't think we'll get any rain today. It's looking, it's not looking great, but it's not looking as bad as it was looking yesterday. Um, I got a few emails from a few people who have heard the lions roaring around the waterhole camera around four o'clock. So Tara is aware. She's also heard them roaring during the night. So she's gonna try to follow up and see if she can find them. And uh, yeah, please stay tuned. And uh, we will be live in, uh, in three minutes. Enjoy the drive and I'll speak to you a bit later. Bye for now. Good morning everybody and welcome to Juma Game Reserve this morning. I'm feeling very dwarfed again. I managed to park on one of the, uh, the lumps in the road, or the mitre drains. But not much change unfortunately. There's still a lot of cloud in the sky. I was hoping there was a few patches of blue but they are starting to close up a little bit. So I think we might still have quite a overcast day. But we'll see. Maybe there'll be a little bit of rain. There was a little bit of rain just before we went on drive and during drive last night. And then there was nothing. It was very weird. It was threatening, but it was all bark and no bite. So we'll see how we go today. But I don't know if any of you were listening to the waterhole camera. There was some lines calling, and thanks to Linda also, about four o'clock she said that she also heard them. I heard the last couple of times around five, ten past five, and I thought, oh, awesome. Maybe they've moved out onto the quarantine area and there's nothing there. I've driven around there. So I'm going to head down towards the down, see if we can find any tracks. If anybody saw where the lines went, then please let me know. I don't know if anyone actually saw them on, on the camera, but definitely heard them. So I have to see where they've gone to. So we're going to try and Vubu Road, I think. That's possibly the best bet, but we shall see. And also, it is the dung quiz, day three of the dung quiz. So I'll be stopping for tracks and dung. Not the best light 
in the world for tracking, but we'll see how we go. Hopefully we'll get some deep tracks somewhere. So lots to look forward to hopefully this morning. Keep your fingers crossed. Also, just to let you know, Anton will be joining me this afternoon. Unfortunately, he wasn't able to join me on a morning drive. I was trying to, but uh, he does have guests to look after as well. So he is going to be joining me on the afternoon drive. So if you can join me for that, please do. He's from the Ingwe Leopard Research. So uh, he's going to also be doing some tracks with us and casting them as well. For those of you who don't know me, my name's Tara. Joining me on camera this morning is Mark. And back in fan control is Sebastian. So if you'd like to ask any questions, please do. It's always great to hear from you. And it's questions at tumo.com. Let's jump aboard so we can go and find, maybe catch up with these lions. Morning, everyone. And it is actually quite warm. It's not, not chilly. All the warmth has been trapped by the clouds. Checking Warburg's nest rows. Patiently waiting your females, hey? Wildebeest. Gnu. Not Billy. It is. How do you Not. tell him? Mm. Perfectly normal to see wildebeest on their own. And that's because he is a bull, as you may guess by the names. And down here in South Africa, they don't go on a migration as such, like they do up in Kenya, Tanzania. And they're also a type of blue wildebeest, the white bearded wildebeest, a subspecies. But they can generally find enough food and water in food that contains enough nutrients all year round, even though during the winter there is obviously less, less food available, but it is still there. So the males quite often will hold a territory all year round, and especially during the breeding season, you'll find the females wandering through the male's territory, although we, there was actually a female herd and they would spend a lot of time with with the territorial bulls. You can see he's a little bit skittish going to and from the water because there could actually be a cat hidden amongst the vegetation there, especially when you're on your own. It's quite dangerous to go down to drink because your eyes and nose that could pick up a potential predator are much closer to the ground. So less likely to pick up a predator at that stage. Eyeballing is. <laughs> that one's got a scar as well. The one that's been here all along. So that would be Billy then? The one that's sleeping on quarantine, yeah. Mm. The normal one. <laughs> oh, nice. Oh, I see he's setting up territory here. Yeah, he is. And that digging is possibly going to go and defecate now, or defecate. But they'll often scrape the feet like that. They've actually got a gland in between the hooves. Wiping his head on it as well. And quite often they will use that as a midden as well, and they'll roll in their dung to make them apparently smell more attractive to the females. There you go. Although they can be quite picky, they won't generally, they won't roll in the fresh stuff that will usually 
a little bit drier because otherwise the fresh stuff does stick to the fur. You may have noticed quite a large lump in front of the eye. That's the preorbital gland, and that also has a secretion that they'll wipe on a tree. And they'll have their favorite trees again to go and mark territory. Should we head over the wall? See if we can go and look in the north. I think Vubu Road might be the way to go then. But we'll check Central, that junction with Central. It's been just as I came to, and I thought, well, I'll just pop my head outside, see if we can get a direction of where that line's calling. It stopped. <laughs> How loud was it? It wasn't that loud, that's what made me think it was actually around here somewhere. Maybe it might have just been at the back of camp, but then again you guys should have heard it if it was just at the back of the camp. Either that or I was dreaming, which it could well have been. noticed that stick pointing up before. I remember that last year. Was it there last year? Where is he? And a blacksmith's lapwing right in the back there as well. Beautiful. They might just be called grey herons, but they're actually quite attractive birds. Now, herons actually have a powder down feather. There's a feather that will grow and it'll break down as it grows and it becomes a powder. And as you saw, he actually wipes his beak on the feathers and you'll wipe it actually on the, those powder down feathers. And that'll help to take the slime from his beak from when he's eating fish or frogs. And then using those large feet, there's actually a comb on one of the toes. And, be able to, and then he can actually comb through his feathers, get rid of that powder down feather, and that's how they keep themselves nice and clean and sludge free. Don't know if you picked up the call there. Voyatella Lodge, just at the end of the dam there. six of them. Lucky. 
find tracks here, but there is tracks for another animal. Okay, first tracking quiz. I'll come back to that question. <coughs> Are you going to be able to get them from there, do you think? Yes. <coughs> yeah, there we go. Okay, I'm going to point them out. That one that you got now. This one. No, the one that you had when I said yes. Okay. So got, uh, can you get both of these two? Mm -hmm. well, that one's too close to the vehicle that you're pointing at now. Yeah. Not as clear as that one, but it might be your shadow that's at that one that's next to your knee. I can get the uh, three now. Oh, okay. Is it these three? Yeah. Let me try and put the other mark on as well. Let's see if that makes a difference. Okay. That was the yep. Hopefully you can hear me. So you've got the tracks. Three okay. tracks. Sorry? Just repeating you. Okay. Just in case. You've got the tracks here. You can see one there. One there, one here, one there. And then there's another one that you can't see that's on the screen, on the screen there. You've got the toes here. One toe, toes. Two toes. Two, three, three toes, four. Four. And then you can just about make out the back of the track there. And so that's the size. And you've got to keep your own scores, and you've got to be truthful. And you get a point for each correct answer, unless I tell you otherwise. But you can either just keep your own scores and see how many you get at the end, or you can also send through your answer and see if you can be the first one back with the right answer. And I'm also keeping score. So I know what we've done, and know if anybody's cheating. So send your answers through to questions at juma.com. In the subject line, put what animal it is and what your name is. And the first six with the correct answer will have the name up on the scoreboard. <laughs> If you've never played before, think of an animal that would be big enough to have a size track of about between 20 and 25 centimetres. So that sort of length. Raisa, first one back. Well done, Raisa. Ha, <laughs> gorilla, Chris and, Chris and Kim. <laughs> Just confirm for me, um, Raisa, what did Raisa say? Ah, okay, cool. <coughs> lion? <laughs> oh dear, I'd be very worried if a lion was that size. 
<laughs> Sorry, from who? Lindsay. I'd be running in the opposite direction from that track, I can tell you, Lindsay. <laughs> running and hiding. Not quite. Line track, you're looking at this sort of, that sort of size. About the size of my hand, actually, for, for lion. So second, coming back with the right answer, Joy. Well done, Joy. Pick off the mark there too. Cheryl, number three. Well done, King Allen. <laughs> Getting the right answer there, number four. Peggy, coming back with fifth position. back with the sixth position. Well done, Carl. Well done, everybody. Quick off the mark there. And whoever said elephant. Elephant, I can kind of see where you're coming from. Because they, they do still have the toenails, but you wouldn't see the toes registering like that. You can see there was four very distinct toes. And the only animal that has four distinct toes lives in Africa is the hippo. The hippo is the correct answer and also what gives it away and that's why I want to try and show you the tracks side by side because they walk very funny they walk like this most animals walk one behind the other like this. But the hippo makes a tram line and that's why if you're near a river and you see a tram line going into the river, be very, very careful because that means it's used by hippo. That means that they exit or enter the river or the dam. And it could well be. Which means they have a very good tram service to the dam. Yeah, very true. <laughs> but it could mean that there could be a hippo lurking and you need to move yourself from that area very, very quickly. <clears throat> Especially dawn and dusk or in winter during the day and you don't want to be getting too close to the edge of the water especially at that point because the hippo could come charging out of you they can charge in the water they can charge at 37 kilometers an hour from the water so if you're not careful you won't have time to react if you're right close to the water's edge highly territorial when they get to water Where did my lion go? I'm getting no tracks. This is not good. It sounds like most people got got hippo. A few elephants. Uh, that was the other one. I was waiting for rhino actually. Rhino, you're very close actually. If you if you join the two front toes together, it would be very close to rhino. But, as I say, rhino don't have the four toes, they have three. Just like the South American tapirs, three toes. And their closest living relative apart from the tapirs, but over here in Africa is the zebra. It's the closest, closest thing to a rhino over here. Good morning, all stations. Uh, I had one and gala collaring around five o'clock this morning. Uh, been around Gary Dam, Lutu and Consoles, just checking up on Professor Cookline. Oh, try talking on channel two, hey? That would be f fun. There we go, try again. <coughs> I think it was a bit quiet. 
Good morning, stations. I heard one in Gala last last night about well this morning about five o'clock. Been checking around Gary Dam, Lutu and Konza so far. <coughs> Texan, Texan, come in. Hello, how are you? Good, thanks. Uh, how are you, Texan? I'm very well, thank you. Uh, I didn't copy what Ephraim had. Uh, could you relay, please? I went to the market and got a massage at the top of the market. Good afternoon, thank you. Uh, did you hear the Angala this morning? I know it's over there. I heard him. They said it's full of quantum coming from some part where the public is getting in and 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 the public is getting in. Maybe we should try a Lego short clip. Apparently someone had tracks over there, this way, so I wonder... I wonder if he's around here. So Rhino, you're looking for three toes on the track, not four. Um, is that Anne, uh, Anna, Anne from Edmonton? I was going to say. Ah, uh, it is Anne from Edmonton, Alberta. There's our line tracks. <laughs> Sebastian's trying to call you Edmonton. I'm going, that doesn't sound right. It's a place. <laughs> I suppose it could be a name as well. Edmund. Hi, Anne. <laughs> Good morning to you. Over in Alberta. Wanting to know, do we have any lion cubs and apparently there's quite a number of lion cubs the sticks have six apparently between them and the Uncahumas also had six although there'll be about four or five months old now and the other older males probably about a year old now Take it a little bit easy along here. And so if I heard it, it didn't sound too far away. And possibly it could have been even from here. Then again, where's Jordan's dam from here, do you know? Oh, yeah. It's at that no, side. Because apparently there's two males, I think they said, two males and a female up that side, up towards Jordan's dam. And I wonder if he was trying to contact them.
set of Unconsas from uh, Doda and Gala and they just by Tamborti down but they head back onto the northern side of Bubbles of Cut Line. Affirmative, uh, uh, there was just a couple of Unconsas and then he turned around and went back onto the northern side of Bubbles of Cut Line. Checking out Sydney's dam then. I was gonna say it could just be that he's lying. Maybe we should just turn around and just check that again. Although he might have just put his head up as we're driving by. Yeah, well, I think I might head down that way. Actually, how far, how close are we to it? So we're about halfway, aren't we? What, the little bit sun? Yeah. It's right here. The, right here. Okay, we'll do that. fascination with when it comes to animal dung <laughs> and why what got me uh, interested in it and it was actually it was when I was working with captive animals and one of the ways to monitor obviously you look at, at how they're doing and because you work very closely with them you get to know the personalities like you do your pets but one of the ways to actually monitor the animal was to look at the dung and look at the consistency of it and if you saw an animal who <clears throat> wasn't well their dung would look very very runny or pale in color or that sort of thing and I suppose from there it was really I started getting interested because you actually, I actually started to understand that you could just tell so much by the dung of an animal still got a lot to learn. Definitely learning every day.
<coughs> Excuse me. Unfortunately, the snake track is just bits. It's not really going to turn out too clear for you to see. Hmm, okay. Right then. That might be our line no longer then. But we'll give it one last shot. Because sometimes if you drive up a road and drive back down again, you, because you're seeing a different perspective, it might just be that the animal's tucked in behind something or maybe just hearing another vehicle might just lift up his head or you might just see a tail flicking. I remember um, with the lemurs especially, I used to work with quite a large collection of lemurs. And if the lemur's dung was yellow, we'd call it scour, especially when it was the babies. The babies would get it, and you knew that they, were, they didn't have long to live. You had to act very quickly, and it would, it, it would go from being fine to being like that in a matter of hours. And if you didn't do something about it, you could lose them. And the giraffes as well. I remember <clears throat> before we let the giraffes out onto the field, I had to check that all the droppings you had to make them walk around and go to the toilet so you could actually see if all of them were fine. Especially like you'd go in and check if you have to see any any runny runny dung, you had to see who it was. Which is not easy with six male giraffes. I'm, I'm thinking maybe he's here, but then again, as I say, it sounded like he was trying to contact, but... Let's see, maybe we check the fire break as well. Maybe he snuck over and I just didn't see. We'll take the fire break to Gallego Shortcut and down Gallego Shortcut, Zoe's Road. But Julie wanting to know the difference between lion and leopard track. Because they do, they, they do look fairly similar. The size helps to give them away. And even a juvenile male lion is going to be bigger than a leopard or even a juvenile female. For their cubs, they should be accompanied by adult tracks. <clears throat> so there's a lot to track. It's not just looking at the one track. It's actually looking at um, what's around it, the habitat, maybe even dung. If the dung's there, they can put the two and two together or vice versa. There's actually a lot to it, but if I can actually show you, the toes on the line are quite quite far from the pad itself. <clears throat> and I remember when I was learning how to track, um, one of the head guides at the time, I remember him saying, and it always stuck with me, it was the first time I saw a leopard track, so also I was, I was a bit worried <clears throat> that I would never know the difference. And when he looked, at the, the leopard track you'd say it looks very neat and it does it almost looks like you know it, it fits into a circle perfectly and if you see here this is um, my, my favorite tracking book and if you look here on this page I've actually drawn a circle around around the track especially the front the front pad which on like on most mammals it's going to be either slightly larger or more rounder than the back track and you can see that 
on here. This is the, the front pad and this is the back pad, slightly oval, but still very, <clears throat> very neat. The toe is fairly close to the back pad here and then also slightly more rounded toes as well. And you can kind of tell the difference between male, though sometimes I still struggle. <coughs> Excuse me. It's more the size than anything. You can see quite, quite nicely here the size difference between the male and female. Females are much smaller. Karula's track's about seven centimeters. Um, in Duna and Mishu's, when they're about a, just around two years old, was about eight, eight centimeters. I don't know what it is now, if it, it has grown anymore. But with the female, if you draw a small circle in the lobe and the straight bit goes, goes out, or you can actually still draw a straight bit before it goes into this curve, it's supposed to be a female. Whereas if we can drop the page, if you can just draw a circle in this part of the lobe and the track just follows it all the way around and there's no straight bit, then it's supposed to be male. But I uh, haven't tested it out completely because, as I say, we usually go off a of size more than anything. And then with the lion, the lion is here, very, very spread out, and it, the toes are actually quite far from the back pad. You can see there's quite a big gap. The toes, these toes, also a little bit further away from the pad. The toes being a little bit more oval. And again, the male tends to be flatter on top, and the female tends to be a little bit rounder. Which can come in quite handy if you've got a juvenile male. But all, again, size should tell you, but it's not always clear. So, difference between male and female. Okay. So, Lego short cut it is. Apparently, the hyena den's active. Sounds like the hyenas have something to eat, so maybe we should make our way down that side. And apparently, there's some elephants. <coughs> Hi Joanne. Good morning to you. What's the maximum distance you can hear the lions roar? Depends on what time of day or night they call, depends on how much vegetation's around. But I have seen comments where you, you potentially could hear lions roaring they're roaring to the, to the full extent, 10 kilometers away. I don't know if 10 kilometers is really that accurate, but maybe if you've got no vegetation and it's in the dead of night, no wind, or maybe some wind actually sending the, the sound down your way. Possibly. But I think more likely is between three, five kilometers just depends on how loud they're calling. And as I say, I was hearing the oof, oof, oof. said to me it was closer, but say I'm not seeing any tracks to suggest that he has crossed over here. do this circle around here. Maybe he's crossed. Maybe I've just missed something. It's possible. There are areas. and I don't go over the road with a fine tooth comb. That's what uh, the tracker does. If you see the tracker sitting on the front of the vehicle. Their, their whole job is to actually look out for tracks and to spot animals. And we do the driving and the, the tracking. 
so there will be times that you will miss things, as you may have seen. Misty, good morning to you. Apparently you were watching Pete's Pond last night and something attacked one of the Egyptian geese and now the Egyptian goose has got one wing missing. And have you ever heard of fish attacking Egyptian geese? Um, I wouldn't thought, I don't think we've got anything that would attack Egyptian geese that size. The catfish can get quite large, but I wouldn't have thought they would go for Egyptian geese. What it might have been is a crocodile. Have you ever heard of catfish attacking for whatever reason? Attacking what? Geese. Uh, big pig. Yeah. It's even the large catfish. <coughs> Where so they? they they they're not really. That was up at Pete's Pond. Apparently, something attacked. I think it's more likely a crocodile. There's not going to be a catfish in Pete's Pond that big enough to take a dove just like Yeah, because I mean catfish can reach about a, a metre, but I don't think Pete's Pond is that big either. So my guess would be a crocodile, Misty. And it just happened to misjudge and rather grab the whole goose. It just grabbed the wing. I should just get hold of the wing. Interesting though. Hi Roger. Morning to you. Wanting to know, do lion tracks go in a straight line like domestic cats and dogs do? Yes, they do. And most animals do, whether it's a rhino or an elephant or um, what else have we got? Antelope, lion, leopard, cheetah, wild dog. They say the hippo is on the odd ones out. I'll tell you something, a hippo will be able to outrun a human, no problem. Let's get and move that to some stage. So now and again, how the something on the leopard? Hi, Abby. And Abby asking why the toes far apart on the leopard. It was on the lion that the toes are a little bit further apart. And it's just been the size of the poor Abby. Abby, sorry. So the leopard is quite a neat track. The toes are quite close together. And one track to actually be careful about is the leopard track and the baboon track. Quite often people mistake the front foot, the front track of the baboon for a leopard track, vice versa. Oops. Found a little bit.
Oh, it's not torn off. It was damaged. Hmm. And thanks, Maisie. Uh, Misty, sorry. Sorry, concentrate on the hole there. Not driving into it and lose mark. But uh, they did actually release a crocodile at Pete's Pond at one stage. I don't know where if it's moved somewhere else or whether it might return. But uh, Misty's saying the catfish are quite large there. So the wing hasn't been broken off completely, I misunderstood. It's just uh, been damaged. See, a monitor lizard would actually take chicks, but adults, that would be too big. Adults would be far too big. Sorry, go ahead, sir. Hi, Teddy. Good morning to you. <laughs> and wanting to know is the not non-showing of rhino going to be permanent or temporary? We don't know at this stage, Teddy. I'm hoping it's not going to be permanent. But uh, we don't even know if, if people really are using the cameras to really locate rhino. I mean, everyone knows there's rhino here. There's, I mean, that's, that's a given. Um, the Sabi Sands, the Greater Kruger National Park. It's not as if the poachers don't know. I mean, <coughs> the poachers are very um, aware when it comes to the areas that they, they're going to target. But just in case, yeah, just in case that they are, that's why the decision's been made not to show them on any of the cameras, including the safari camera. So, I don't know, Teddy. I really don't know. It depends on what happens with the poaching, I suppose. But I can't tell you. I'm hoping it's not going to be permanent. Oh, hello, Ellie's. Oh, look. Tiny, tiny baby. All right, hello. <laughs> yeah. And the short tail drone goes. <laughs> Station Slambiaf and Love Glego shortcut near the dip. Yeah, I just didn't want to turn on the vehicle again. Those boys are up to you. Have you got some tissue back there? Is it down here?
Thank you. You hear the orange breasted bush right calling. Was it Patrick used to say, coffee tea or me? Coffee tea or me? <laughs> I wonder if he was going to do that. He had that cheeky look. Mischievous. You can see he was playing with his trunk. It was almost if you could see the cogs ticking going, shall I do it or not? He's actually quite happy now. He's just making sure that we knew our place. Sorry, just say that last part again, like, like what? Good morning to you, Ryan. I'm not sure what exactly you're asking, but wanting to know if elephants go on the rampage like something. I, I didn't, I'm still not hearing the last part. But it's very, very, very rare that they would go on a rampage. Um, you wouldn't, you wouldn't really, it's not really something that you would expect from an elephant. If you see them charging, it, it means that they've been upset by something, and maybe that's that's what you're meaning. Um, if there's a predator around, they will, they will defend the young, and then quite often they will move away. But if they feel threatened enough, and if there's no escape route, then, then they would actually charge towards. But they wouldn't really do it out of, out of spite. They're not that kind of, they're not that kind of animal. I mean, there's always a reason for any animal to react the way that they, they react and 
I've heard of very sad stories where animals have just been, and, and even elephants, where they've just been mistreated, and unfortunately they just they associate humans with with bad bad things, and they just want to get away from humans. Um, the Elephant Whisperer is a very interesting book, and it was actually all about that. And there was a herd of elephants that had. Uh, been through a lot and I think some of the family had actually been killed uh, they'd been shot at and killed in front of them and they they just associated humans with with things that happened that were bad and a reserve was asked to take them on otherwise they were going to go into captivity or even uh, be put down and they said okay well we'll take them it was this very small family and they broke out a couple of times. They broke out of the, the, the holding enclosure. I think we're going to move on because the elephants have actually moved off. We had a really nice sighting of elephants yesterday, both drives. So I'm going to continue on. I think there's some more elephants down towards where the hyena den is. Because this is very, very thick bush. It's very difficult to get in here. We'll see if there's any more further down. Uh, Anthony Lawrence was his name, and he actually took took these elephants in. And as I say, they, he was actually warned uh, by the authorities that if the elephants broke out again, they would they would have to put them down. So he actually spent a lot of time with them, and he he was he actually slept by the boma. He said. And the one female, she was going to try and break out again. And apparently, he, it, it was actually, it was very, very, an, it's an amazing story. But I, I do believe what he's written because of what we've seen here with elephants and what we know about elephants. And I really don't think he was, you know, embellishing the story at all. And he said, you know, he sort of pleaded with her. And she actually obviously pick, picked up on what he, how he was saying it, or his um, his body language, and just just maybe even his aura. I mean, animals, elephants are, are very keyed into how how humans react and how they feel. I mean, I've heard some amazing stories about how elephants can sense things, um, things wrong with people. And she she sat up and take and took notice, and she actually didn't break out that night. And she tried again the next night, and he did the same thing. And they went through this whole thing together. And he was actually able to turn this family around enough that people, guests, could actually go and view these elephants, these elephants that would actually charge at people and and be so ag ag aggressive because they had this fear of humans. And they actually ended up breeding, and apparently they still they're still doing well. Quite an amazing story. So yeah, he's called Anthony Lawrence, the Elephant Whisperer. If you really enjoy reading about animal behaviour and true life stories, definitely recommend it. And there was a very sad point where. <clears throat> the um, the bull unfortunately did turn and he, he couldn't believe it he, he'd gone he'd, he'd seen this little boy grow up and the guides are starting to say you know he's he's starting to charge at vehicles and he's starting to be very grumpy and they he said no I, do, I don't I don't believe it and he went to see him and he said he you know he was very relaxed as he as he always was and he came up to the vehicle he used to come up to the vehicle so that he could have a chat almost with with uh, this guy and apparently he came up and I can't I can't remember the full the full ins and outs but somehow he I think he bumped himself on the vehicle or something happened with the vehicle and he just turned and he started becoming extremely aggressive and he actually started attacking the vehicle, he was pushing the vehicle over and unfortunately um, he had to make the, the very hard decision to, to, to put him down um, because he, he couldn't 
risk the, get the, the, the lives of the guests and you actually follow this story very, very heartbreaking. And what they found is when they did, they did have him uh, put down, what they actually found was his tusk had uh, quite a big abscess and I think it actually had split and because he banged his tusk on the car that was why he became so aggressive because obviously the pain just shot right through him and that's why I'll always believe if something happens there is something there, there is something wrong there is either the animals in pain or something has happened bad in their life but there is always a story behind it. I'll never believe an animal will attack just because they can. They're not capable of that. Humans are. Humans, yeah, that's another story. But animals, no. But very, very sad. The fact that they had, they went through that and they had, to, and they found that out afterwards. But very, very moving story. Some people are asking if Mark's whistling at the back there. <laughs> Apparently you keep hearing the whistling. There's the uh, orange-breasted bush shrike that's been calling. That coffee tea or me. And the Fort Tell Drongos. Oh, it's getting closer and closer. <laughs> no. Oh, okay. Oh, you know what? I think it's my steering wheel. I think it's making that squeak again every so often. Oh. Okay, sorry. Okay, I'll come back to Roz's question. Morning, Roz. But uh, we have got... A second quiz. I'm looking in the wrong direction for it. Okay. There you go. So, let me just make a note of this. Otherwise, I will forget. A little bit cruel. It can get much bigger. But if you have a look at the colour, that should help to give it away. And there's no midden around. So it's on its own. And we've got some leaf in there. Bits of bark in there. So, who dung it? So, a fairly young animal, just to help you with the size there. Have a look at the colour, it should help you as well. So again, if you've just joined us and you want to play along, <coughs> then um, just send your answer questions at juma.com. You can send in the subject line, what animal dung it is, and your name. And we'll see who the first six people are back. And keep a track of your score, see how well you do on the drive. If you want to try and join me for a few other drives and see if you can get a big score.
over the next few drives. Going to be going for a couple of weeks. Standing by. Uh, sorry, I just left them and they were slowly heading east. Uh, visual wasn't great, they were flambing, flambering into the bush. Uh, did you manage to catch up with the ones around the Mbisi Kaya? Yeah, I provide some good interaction between Mbisi and the Zed. Yeah, and the Zed. So, thanks, thanks, sir. And no, Matato, are you still at the Mbisi Kaya? I just looked in now. Uh, most of the rumors are just the table, but it's so that the Zed is I don't know if they're going to come back. Okay, copy. I'll see if I can uh, make my way down there. Thank you. Question just before I jumped off the vehicle. And oh, I've just. Uh, it was Ros, was it Ros? Rose, Ros. Ros, yeah, it was Ros. Um, have I ever seen an elephant being attacked by a lion? No, I haven't. I haven't. It generally happens. Oh. Well, I've got a couple of dagger boys there too. Yeah, okay, copy, thank you. Um, I'm just going to head down to the NBC car. The little buffalo is quite far into the bush, but I just want to go and see if the hyenas are out. Apparently the elephants were just there, so they might have just chased them off. You generally hear about lions attacking elephants up in Botswana. And what's quite interesting is if the matriarch or the, the elephants have experienced lions attacking them, especially the, the youngsters, if they hear lions calling, they'll immediately go on the alert. But elephants that haven't had that experience of lions attacking them, they don't show that, that same reaction. They don't go into a, a, a defense. And especially when males call, they've actually found, I forget which area in Botswana, but where the males seem to, to hunt baby elephant more than the females, the, the, the elephants will react to the males calling even more so than the females calling. Absolutely amazing, very impressive. And that's something about elephants. We think we know a lot and actually the more you find out about them, the more you realize you don't know anything. <laughs> morning, morning. Morning. That's not true. We do know quite a lot, but <laughs> the more doors are open, the more we realise there's more behind them than what we thought. I've got more Ellie's down here. Yes, I'm ready. I'm ready, I'm ready, I'm ready. Lorry in 
California coming back first with the right answer. The done quiz. Well done, Laurie. Ellen! Hi, Ellen. Welcome on board. Ellen coming in with second place. Cheryl Ann, third. Betts, fourth position. Well done, Betts. Glad to see you got that one right. And Emma, fifth position. I just want to go around the back here, but I think the hyenas might not be coming out to play by the sounds of it. Angela, sixth position. Well done. Sounds like pretty much everybody got it right. For those that said rhino. Did anyone going to say right now? Ida and Frank said rhino. Jane saying Eland. Oh, Jenny, sorry, Jenny from Indiana saying Eland. Interesting one. <laughs> and Vicky saying young giraffe. But the answer is elephant, these guys. You see them eating leaves, you see them eating twigs and bark, and that's what we're picking out the dung. And because they eat quite a lot of bark, there's a lot of tannins. That's, that's what gives the dung that red color, that beautiful deep red color, or reddish brown color. And it's big barrel shaped. Use some sanitizer. Thanks, Dawn. <laughs> Looking after us. So yes, elephant dung. Why is it not rhino dung? How do you tell the difference? Well, if you start to look a little bit closer, there is a huge amount of difference between white rhino dung and elephant dung. The white rhino eat grass. You won't find leaves and twigs in white rhino dung. And because they don't eat the bark and the twigs, there's no tannin in there, so it tends to be very dark in colour, almost black, especially when it's fresh. But certainly you just find all the grass, you don't find the leaves and the bark in there. And also, that's why I was saying I didn't, I didn't see a toilet around there, there was no midden, because rhinos use toilets or middens to mark the territory. Just like we saw with the wildebeest earlier, they will also go, in, go, uh, go to the toilet in, a, in the same spot, and then they'll actually wipe their feet in the dung so that their scent is on their feet and as they walk they can mark the road. Hello lady. <laughs> You've been terrorizing the hyenas. Hello, Mrs. Eddie. 
can see her relaxing her leg there. <laughs> Beautiful lady. It's absolutely incredible. And we have been discussing the power of an elephant. I mean, they they just have this this ability to be able to push down trees, and you know nothing really can stand in the way of an elephant. And yet, you can see they're not aggressive creatures. It's it's if you ever find an aggressive elephant, as I said before, there is usually something else, something that's happened in their life to make them like that but generally this is what elephants are like You can see the stain on a tusk where she's been breaking branches over a tusk. And they're actually there to help gather food in breaking grass over it or breaking branches. We're using it to sort of chisel away at the bark on a tree. We're even using it to dig in the ground for a root breaking roots over it. I mean, it's such a useful tool. You can often find that they have a master and a slave tusk. So you have one that's that does all the work, or they favour that one to do the work, just like we use our right or left hand to write. So you can have a right or left tusked animal. Elephant characters are as diverse as any human. And you do get some individuals that are maybe a little bit more bold than others, or a little bit more curious than others, or a little bit more easygoing than others. You get some that are quite happy just to go along with the flow. You get some that are leaders. I can't imagine this place smells that nice to them though. The hyenas actually being here and 
pasting around here and well, the sort of smells quite high to them. Now, even though we can't see any other elephants, it's not to say they aren't around and they're not in contact. Could be she's part of the herd upon Gallego shortcut. Could be that there's another herd elsewhere. But it's believed that they can actually hear and recognize individuals over a kilometer and a half away. And they can actually hear over many more kilometers. Hi Angela and welcome on board again and asking about the the liquid just behind the eye and is it not from a bull that's in must and isn't he a bit dangerous if he is in must and the gland behind the eye or the temporal lobe weeps in both sexes the male and female so Generally, you are right. Generally, the, the male, when he's in must, that temporal lobe will weep. But there's also a few other signs to say that he's in must as well. But that's quite a, a nice visual sign if you can't smell him, if you're down the wrong side of him, if you're upwind from him. Then you often won't be able to smell him unless he comes fairly close. But he also dribbles urine. And generally, on the inside of his legs, it'll be green from the constant dribbling of urine and he'll have this very strong musty smell. But this is actually a female and it's a female with probably three of her offspring all of different ages. This is a, f a small family group. And if a female's in estrus those glands can also weep but if they're stressed they will weep and I noticed one of the calves also had a weeping temporal lobe so it could be that they they were a bit stressed, maybe even when they were chasing the hyenas off, maybe they started to weep then. But even when a bull's in must, 
Um, you do obviously have to be very cautious because, as I said earlier, there are individuals who have different characters, and if an individual's had a bad run-in with humans and vehicles, that tends to make them slightly more uh, aggressive towards vehicles just because they have had bad experience. Um, they tend to be a little bit more uneasy if they've moved out of the normal home range, if there's an area that they, they're used to, and they be, uh, come into must, they'll go searching for females, and they may leave that area that they know, and it can mean that it's a little bit more stressful for them because they might meet up with males they don't know, they don't know uh, their capabilities and the area around them, they, don't, they won't know too well. So it can be quite stressful for them and that can also put uh, a male elephant a little bit more, or make him a little bit more uneasy. So there's a lot of factors. But generally, I mean, the, the bulls that we've seen here in Must, generally they've all been very relaxed and they will get close to the vehicles and they, you know, there's no malice in them, there's no aggression there. Uh, Mark had one. I had uh, a male there the other day, yesterday in fact. I'm actually going to just pull back. Lutu, the and love. Chase them off. <laughs> yeah. I don't know where, Jog didn't say where they went. I don't know if they went into the den or whether they went into the drainage line, but he said the, the elephants chased them away. <laughs> No worries. Leopard activity further north, apparently. Bob, good morning to you, but ah, there we go. Aha. I was just, I was actually wanting just to sit on this side, just to see once the elephants have gone, see if if the uh, cubs are going to come back out again. So she's watching the elephants. I was hoping that was going to happen. Was going to happen. Where's your cubs? Are you not mama? Uh, from I've got one in BC here. I'm hoping that the mumpimpans might come out as in love leave. Oh yeah, it is one of the mums. down the back. Just move back a little bit. I'm not going to go down there because otherwise it's going to be closing in. He's stopped there. I'm just going to pull around so we can see the entrance a little bit better.
<laughs> Still watching the elephant. Sorry, Bob. Bob was asking um, about elephant eyesight and is it good? And it's, it's supposed to be very good close vision, but long distance vision, uh, it's, it's not great. Got quite poor long distance vision. But when you've got a fantastic sense of smell and a fantastic sense of hearing, then you can afford to have uh, a fairly poor long distance sight and actually have better close vision so you can actually see what you're eating and see where you're going. But they're supposed to have a sense of smell which is 28,000 times better than our own. And they're better than a bloodhound when it comes to following a scent. And they're actually being used to, to uh, find poachers. I actually saw uh, a clip the other day, I forget which program it was, but they were actually using elephants to track poachers. They would give them the scent just like a, a bloodhound and they would find them. And this is exactly why hyenas have a den. Hyenas hide the, the cubs in an old abandoned termite mound. They'll excavate probably holes made by aardvark at some stage. So if there's any threat, they can just shoot straight back into the den and there'll be small chambers inside that not even adults can get into. See the entrance both sides, it's big enough to fit an adult in there, but the deeper down you, you go, it's going to be smaller. And we actually noticed that Teddy went in this side and the, the baby hyena, which is probably about a week, a uh, month a month, maybe five weeks old, something like that, and it actually came through the other side. So there's obviously a little chamber that is joining the two now that Teddy can get through, but the other other hyena can't, so it'll be very small. And Teddy will probably be able to just sit in there if there's any predators, other predators around, any other hyena around, and he can actually just sit in there and, and keep out of reach. And that's exactly why they have the dens the way they are and sometimes you won't even have a babysitter sometimes all the adults will be away and the, the cubs are left to their own devices and the instinct is to survive and dive into those holes at any sign of trouble and you'll see if there is a mother around they're a little bit more relaxed but still if there's a sound that they don't like even if mum doesn't react they'll still run into the hole And this is another animal that we've really been mistaken about over the, so many years. And again, there's been a lot of research into hyenas and there's been a lot of, a, a lot more understanding of hyenas through this research. Oh, they're coming down here.
Okay, maybe we should leave her. Leave her. We'll continue on. Hi, Joanne in Arkansas. Up on board. And sorry, that question has literally just popped out of my head. Oh, that's it. When an elephant gives birth, do they all protect her? And it generally is a family affair. have all the uh, experienced mothers on hand and all the youngsters intrigued at what's going on. And that's one of the reasons why elephants do live in a herd, is, is for protection. of sniffing it and, and getting to know it and obviously a baby elephant even though there's a lot of adults around it's going to be very vulnerable and that's why they do need the adults around to protect it and especially in the first I think it takes them an hour or so to get the feet it's going to be very unstable Stations leaving and busy Kaya with two stations. Hello, Hello Graham, how are you? Good, how are you Good, thanks. I didn't, uh, I didn't see them. I went down on the western side, but I didn't see them sitting in the the fever trees, but I'm not sure if they were there last night or not. Hi Jojo, good morning to you. Wondering what would make the elephant leave the area? Uh, as I said, the, the males, when they come into must, need to go and search for females, and if there's no females around where he's, where he's living, he needs to go and find the females. But elephants, it's not just like the, the a small area that they cover. The area that they'll call home will be extremely large and it's it's not protected, it's not they're not territorial animals. So they can travel many kilometers in what's called a home range. As I say, they, they can the males can leave those areas that they, they know well in search of the females. But they're driven by mostly that it will be the change in the seasons, finding water and finding food. What generally you find in summer is that they'll stay in one place longer 
they'll maybe move around in a small area say uh, Juma Game Reserve said the, the thousand hectares that we traverse so they'll during the summer we'll often see the same same female herds on a few consecutive days because they, they don't go too far whereas during the winter time they tend to move around much larger areas searching for the food and then you go even further than that in that there are some herds that maybe utilize this area for only certain times of the year so you'll find that there are herds that are coming through now that we saw this time last year but we won't see them maybe during the, the summer time maybe we will but I remember the collared females, the collared elephants, we didn't see and, uh, during the summer, or maybe we saw one of them, I forget now, but I remember seeing one of the females at this time last year, and we saw her again this time last year, at uh, this time, they were self confused. And then you get the marula season. And all the marula trees around here is going to pull in a lot of elephants. That's one of their favourites. And the mapani trees and all sorts of parts to the season are very subtle. But that's what will also draw elephants to certain spots for certain types of trees. Calling magpie shrike. What's going on there? Oh. Looks like the helpers. Possibly even chicks, excuse me, from last year. Oh, they're just they're strengthening the bonds there. Possibly either the pair to strengthen their bond and they may actually start to mate. But, and maybe one of the chicks just copying, or chicks from last year. Because they do live as a family, you have the male and the female. And then chicks will then help to rear the next set of chicks. So they do live as a family. Oh, beautiful. And all the calling that's going on at the moment is just strengthening the family bonds. It's the first time I've seen that though. But they're, all four of them were actually sitting and holding the wings up. They usually nest, there's a little tamborti tree just on the, the junction here, which is where they usually nest. We'll have to keep an eye on that. Beautiful liquid core. Should we try Treehouse Dam? We'll try Treehouse and Chelapan, I think. Is there any idea where Karula's cubs might have been? Oh, they were seen yesterday, were they? In the drainage line behind camp? Yeah. Okay, I wonder if they're still around there then. Might well be.
that Baz from Netherlands, is that right? There's a bit of interference there. Hi Baz, um, I'm thinking I'm getting your questions, a lot of interference there. But good morning to you, over there in the Netherlands. One, and you want to know about the relatives to the hyenas. And I couldn't hear if you said they are or not relative to the cats and what I think you're saying they are and what makes them different to the dogs. Oh, what they have got in common with cats. Okay, so what have they got in common with cats? They... There's, it's, it's mostly to do with the skulls. They, they actually have a lot of similarities. Little bone in the ear, the auditory meters it's called, is a ring in cats and hyenas, it's a little ring, whereas in dogs it's it's a long, long thing tube. And there's a couple of other things actually on the skull. The little lump at the back, the auditory bole is, is divided in the cats by a septum, so there's a, a front and back chamber of that, whereas in the dogs it's it's not there. I keep meaning to bring my skull. I've got a replica leopard skull and I'll try and bring that on board again next time and, and see if I can actually show you because it's easier to show you rather than to explain. But it's the two little knobs at the back of, at the base of the skull. So there's there are a couple of differences, but as I say, mainly in the skull, because originally they were classified as dogs, and then possibly that's where the name for the, the the offspring came from, you usually say pups, although pups or cubs can be used. Because obviously now they've decided that they're closely related to cats, so technically cubs is for cats. And they do also have claws that show all the time. They don't have the, the claws that retract. So they do share some things, some similarities with dogs, but they have decided that they are related to cats. Mm. Hello Impala. Goodbye Impala. I see a poor run, and he's running away from me. <laughs> this is a brilliant bird. This is probably one of the best birds for the display. Red crested Koran. The kamikaze bird. And they fly two or three meters up in the air, close the wings, and drop down to earth, and that's to impress the females. Oh, zebras up ahead. And you can tell the experience from the non experienced because the experienced Korans will open their wings just at the last minute and land very gracefully, whereas the inexperienced <laughs> don't. <laughs> and they actually just land on the ground, shame. It takes them a couple of attempts and then they actually realise if they open the wings they don't get a bump. So in Kanyin, a female leopard, her cub's just been found in Buffalo. Hook. Unfortunately we can't go there. Oh, what zebra's looking at? Something going on with the zebras down there. Okay. 
We need another done question. Are you ready? <laughs> if I can find some. Okay, a few more questions apparently coming through. Uh, what was Giddy's question? Oh, the pace from the hyena. Here's more elephant. That's what they were watching. Wow, lots of elephants. The pace from the hyena. Sorry, Gilly. Um, is actually territorial marking again. Um, they usually do use dung. But they do use paste. And they'll actually walk over the stalk, the grass stalk, and deposit this very strong smelling paste to mark the territory. It also says who they are in the clan, if they're male or female, and it'll also say if they're receptive or not to breed. This could be the herd that our other elephant at the hyena den is part of. She was moving this way. Stations, more and love, uh, just on Fulhamman's cut line and junction with Shabam Road. And love. Hi Vivian, wanting to know, and I'm sure a few other people do, uh, wanting to know the skull that Mark found yesterday, does it belong to Floppy Ear? As yet we don't know, it could be. Um, apparently there was another, another Floppy Eared hyena, and that's possibly who we saw the other day, uh, myself, when we were following Mvula, we had a hyena following him, myself and Seb, and that's possibly this other floppy-eared hyena, not the matriarch floppy ear. She, has, she hasn't been seen at least for a couple of months, but I remember when she had cubs last time, she, went, she disappeared. We didn't see hide nor hair of her for a good three or four months. So I'm still holding out hope that she's just disappeared to go and have her cubs. That's what I'm hoping. <laughs> so you got the Birchall's or common plain zebra up ahead of us. It looks like a couple of family groups. And actually, the more you look into it, the more you see that animals live in family groups. A lot of animals do, relying on eyes and ears to detect predators and for defense. And howdy, Roz. Roz wanting to know, do hyenas take over the dens? I think we've got quite a big lag now. So there's a few hyena questions coming in. But, uh, apologies for not getting to the questions sooner. Oh, oh, we're with the zebra now. Okay, cool. <laughs> so, uh, Roz wanting to know, do the hyenas take over the den site of others or do they dig their own? And it's generally taking over holes made by aardvarks into termite mounds, possibly because the termite mounds will provide a lot of nice 
cool shade during the heat of the day. And it's a pretty strong fortress as well. Roger, wanting to know what the birds were again. Uh, they were magpie shrikes. The old name was a long-tailed shrike. And a few people ask actually why birds change their names. Personally, I think it's so they can sell books. But it, uh, the official version is that we're supposed to come in line, or they've done it to come in line with the rest of the world. So there's birds that had names that were, that had different names according to everybody else in the world. So they've changed to come into line with them and there's birds that had the same name as other birds, different birds elsewhere in the world. So they had to get changed. But personally I think it is just to sell more books. It's a conspiracy. Zebra's watching. Hmm. Wow. <laughs> and all the babies as well. <laughs> Curious little boy. <laughs> Hi Randy, good morning to you over there in Iowa, and I think you were asking, do elephants eat the same thing when they're young, was that, was that, I couldn't quite understand the question, oh all year round, sorry, I was thinking it just, it didn't make sense in my head, do they eat the same things all year round, and it is seasonal uh, Randy, so when the fruits are on the trees, they'll eat a lot more fruits. During the winter time you'll see that they eat a lot of roots, a lot more roots than what they do during the summer. Um, they'll eat quite a lot of leaves in the summer compared to the winter because it will depend on where the nutrients are and in summer the nutrients tend to be in the leaves whereas in the winter it tends to be in the roots. There you, go, you can see they're also taking grass and again, during the summertime, they're going to be taking a lot more grass. It's going to be a bit like hay now. So it does depend on the season. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Fantastic. No matter what the animal is, it's always amazing just to feel trusted, you know, when they do come close to the vehicle. And at the end of the day, it's up to the animal how close they get to us. And, you know, you can, even if it's just a zebra and they allow you to be that close to them, or an elephant walking in front of your vehicle, or a leopard, it's, it's, it's amazing.
Hmm. Should we go and catch up with the zebra? Leave the family to their breakfast. Hi, Susan. <laughs> Good morning to you. Wanting to know, do the babies... Do baby elephants lie down? Grab something. Yeah. Do babies sleep lying down? Do babies sleep lying down and do the adults? Do the babies sleep close to their mother? And yeah, they do sleep lying down. Obviously, when they're babies, they're much smaller. So the, the pressure on their bodies is not going to be as great as an adult. So you'll often find them lying down a lot more than the adults. But adults can lie down, and they do lie down. And they find them propping themselves up against a termite mound or a tree. And they'll take naps rather than a long, a long snooze. And if you count all the naps up, it can average out about six, six hours sleep. Now the grevy zebra, which you might have heard about in East Africa, have very, very thin stripes. And they live quite differently to the virtual zebra that we have here. Although I still need to look into that, because there, there was a couple of uh, books that, that were released uh, in the early 2000s. And one of them is the Bible to South African mammals. And according to them, the virtual zebra, which is what this zebra is supposed to be, was no longer. And these were actually common or plain zebra. And they actually thought that the virtual zebra had died out in this area. And because these zebra were different to the ones in East Africa, because of the shadow stripe on the rump, which this one has a very, very faint stri shadow stripe, it's the brown in between the black black stripes which sets them apart they actually thought that the virtual zebra down here are no more so that's why these zebra were known as common or plains and the ones in East Africa were known as virtuals but Wikipedia which it, it can get things wrong but it seems to be fairly spot on and now as a saying that now it's believed that they are virtuals so I still need to look into it but for all intents and purposes they are virtuals the time being, they're watching. There's a bat of deer flying overhead. There's one zebra watching it. So the Grevy zebra up in East Africa, very thin stripes, and that's one of the ways you can actually tell the difference between zebras is the, th the thickness of the stripes. But the subspecies or well, different species of zebra are very distinct, very different, including their chromosomes. And the different species of zebra actually have different numbers of chromosomes. So a grevy zebra is as different to a plain zebra as a, a horse is to a donkey. Ah. 
Who was that? Hi, Vicky. Vicky wanted to see some A-tracks. I'm looking for... Oh, I actually wanted to show you some, but with the others being there, it's going to be a bit difficult. And the sun's not, not brilliant at the moment. But I will definitely try. Oh, battle is going in. Ah, Bastille found something. Let's poke a nose and see if we can see where it landed. Warburg's has also just flown in. There it goes. Can you see it looks like it's going up to that tree? I think it actually caught something rather than saw a carcass. I can't see him in that tree. I thought he was going to fly into that tree, but he's not. No, he's not there. He flew off. But, are you ready for your next dung question? This is it. I'll put it on the dashboard. So again, questions at juma.com. Oh, Mark wants to look at the eagle first. Okay. <laughs> Pale face Warburgs. Did you see two pale face the other day? Yeah, they are. Nice. It's probably the pale made of the dark one we saw yesterday when we found the hyena spot. Hmm. Okay. There you go. Question number three for the day. Who dung it? If I can show you. Let's see the size. If I break it open, you can see what's inside. So questions at juma.com, who dung it? But I actually want to try and get a little bit closer to the eagle and try and see him a little bit better. Can get closer, right? oh, I was wanting to actually get a little bit closer to the eagle and see if we can see him a little bit better. I can't hear you, closer to what? Do you want me to get closer to the dung? Oh uh, no. <laughs> I wanted to get closer to the eagle. And see if we can see him a little bit better. So I, I wanted to do that first. See what he's doing. So unfortunately the light is not brilliant, the sun's just behind it.
I can hear the shrill cry of dwarf mongoose. Obviously not liking the fact that there's a Warburg's eagle or any form of eagle sitting close by. Although what was quite interesting is uh, down in the Cape there was a research, I think it was in the Cape, there was a research project on dwarf mongoose and they actually found that when a battalier flew over the, the battalier, they, they didn't actually give an alarm call because the battalier's shadow does look very different to that of other eagles and they concluded that probably the battalier didn't hunt the dwarf mongoose but interestingly enough here we have actually seen them give an alarm call for a battalier flying over which maybe suggests that battaliers might actually hunt the dwarf mongoose here Preening is always important for any bird, keeping the feathers in good condition, making sure they get rid of any damaged ones, because all that will actually affect the way the bird flies. So that's why you see birds preening so much and taking care of those feathers. I think he's actually watching the, the mongoose below it. Hmm. Cool, shall we continue on? Just in here. <laughs> we might just be able to hear them. Beautiful. It's all right, guys, it's gone now. Hmm. Relief. Okay, okay, okay. Yes, I definitely am. Ah, well done, Steph. Coming in in first position, the dung quiz. Virginia Moore, second position. Well done. Third position goes to Gilly. Oh, that's why I'm 
I'm struggling. Fourth position goes to Julie. Well done, Julie. Vicky, well done, Vicky. And last position, well, say last, sixth position. Who is sixth quick off the mark? David, David Stroke. Well done, David. <laughs> So, is there any wrong answers? Ooh. Okay, let's see how we can do with this. Wildebeest, Impala, Kudu. Are you going to be able to see those tracks? Hippo. Huh? Okay, cool. So, just uh, for the antelope, too big, and for the hippo, too small. Nice try, though. And the actual contents inside was quite fibrous. So, the correct answer was zebra. Now, this is going to be your fourth. I'm hoping it's going to work because the sun isn't working with us. Let's see how it turns out. Oh, yes. You can see it. Okay, I'm going to go around and point it out to you. But this is going to be your fourth one. So the dung was zebra dung. Uh, I've changed the mic. Oh. Now go again. Huh? Oh, now. The dung was zebra dung. Okay. this time. Let's do this. Well, do you want to pass me the camera down? I can do better. Maybe. I don't know how far you'll be able to go away. I just can't clean over like this. It's just impossible, physically. be able to see okay and yeah. So hopefully you can see if I'm, try I'm trying to hold it still enough. Unfortunately, I haven't got enough lead now to get close enough. But on the bottom of the screen, hopefully you can see the foot. And that's just there. So that's, that's the foot there. And you can just about see the toes. And the fifth toe there. And then at the top of the screen, you can see the front foot so just there and then the long the long toes there so we're a little bit limited there I thought we were going to be able to see it a little bit better the sun's not great but hopefully you can see that
Also, I just want to say with the zebra dung, I'm waiting for answers for the fourth track, the fourth question. It's the kidney shaped for the zebra dung, and it's quite large. The other, or the antelope, the pellets are quite small. The largest pellet you'd find is this sort of size. And someone said eland, excuse me, for elephant dung um, just before. And eland, you're, not, you're looking at probably about this sort of size for eland and that sort of thickness. So still smaller than the, the zebra dung. And the reason being all the antelope, including the eland and the giraffe, have a four-chambered stomach. And they get as much goodness out of their food as possible. Whereas the zebra, the rhino, the elephant, even the hippo, very poor digestive system. Hippo is a special case, but for intents and purposes, a lot poorer digestive system than the antelope. So that's why you get much larger dung. So that's the zebra dung. And when you do look at it inside, you can see quite large pieces still of grass that they're eating still quite fibrous whereas when you break open the dung of a, an impala or even a kudu it's very very fine fragment and you won't find you know big pieces like this so that is why it's a zebra dung I've got my little sanitizer here for the dawn great okay so I'm, say, I'm hoping you could see the, the track, hoping all the explanation came out. Oh, I better write it down as well. Already, that's not good. Hi, Wendy. Good morning to you. Wanting to know the wingspan of an adult Warburg's eagle. Sure, difficult one that one. I actually, I, I don't think I've ever looked at. The wingspan. Maybe someone can check it for us. I would say probably around the meter, one meter thirty centimeters for the wingspan. But maybe someone can actually check for us. That's good. Ah, Deb, Steph. Steph wanting to know where does the Hartman's mountain zebra come into it? And the Hartman's is another type of zebra, um, quite, quite a lot larger than the Birchall's. And it's got this huge dewlap underneath. And that's one of the things that makes it very distinctive, the Hartman's Mountain Zebra. So just uh, another species of zebra, different to the normal mountain zebra. The mountain zebra don't have as large a dewlap, flap of skin underneath the neck. Oh, now I see what you're saying. Sorry. So Steph actually, uh, Steph, Steph was asking a question about zebra. <laughs> that was in the subject title. <laughs> now I understand you, Sebastian. Sorry. I thought it was a question mark about whether she was right or not. So who was the who was the second? 
So everyone needs to move up a place. So Steph was asking a question. <laughs> <laughs> oh, brilliant. <laughs> so, yeah. So, who was second? So, so Virginia's in sixth, posi sixth position. So, sorry about that. <laughs> I was. You're confusing me now, Sebastian. <laughs> Okay, so Virginia was actually first, so I just need I need the second place, uh, not the second place, the sixth place. So everybody who was after Steph, you move up position. Virginia got first place, and we need a sixth, a sixth. Who came in? Amber. Amber was sixth. Okay, so you nearly got uh, recognition there, Steph, for your question. Great timing. differences hi Frank and Ida welcome again any differences between African and Asian elephants there's a few um, it's an except size and ear shape what are the differences and the differences there's actually the ribs the number of ribs in African there's 21 sets of ribs and in Asian it's 20 In African elephant, if you notice on the tip of the trunk, got a red leaf and the, the new red leaves of the jackalberry. Oh, the jackalberry! Oh, we can have a look at the jackalberry. Oh, she's pointing out the new red leaves of the jackalberry there. Got the algae all bloom here, at Chelapan again. At the at the tip of the trunk of the elephant you'll see the two uh, finger-like pro projections at the end and on the Asian elephant they only have one those are the main differences okay, that's yeah we are gonna have to say goodbye uh, very shortly um, Asian elephants tend to have a lot more uh, pigmentation on their skin quite pinkish whereas the African elephants don't have that I think if we can just have the six answers to the tracks, we're going to have to go, unfortunately. So if Sebastian can give us the six answers. Alan, well done. First place with Baboon. That is the correct answer. Joy. Gilly. Third place. Randy in Iowa, number four. And fifth and sixth. Fifth, Virginia. Well done, Virginia. Virginia Garcia, okay, so two different Virginias. And sixth position. Oh, not a sixth position at the moment. This one tripped up a few people by the sounds of it, so we don't have a sixth position. And we had lion, hyena, leopard, and scrub hair. So this was the one that I said you need to be very careful of, because you get it mixed up with cats. So the long toes, and it, it, looked, it looks a bit like a human's foot, if, that's, if um, you can remember it that way. Um, I was drawing the, the foot, the outline of the foot, and then on the, the hand, the long fingers, almost like a human. So those are the things to look out for. But you're right, it, it does look like a cat, and uh, it, it does trip up a few people, even guides. It does, you do have to second look. 
But unfortunately, we are going to have to go. Uh, beautiful jackalberry with the red leaves. But we are going to have to go because the inverter is starting to beep. But uh, I'm glad we managed to get the last track in there. I'm aiming to try and get four or five on drive. Uh, see if we can do that. So do join me for this afternoon. Anton is going to join me and he's going to, hopefully we're going to cast a, a track or two, uh, seeing what we go out and about to find. Uh, maybe even try and see if we can find Karula this afternoon. Uh, no sign of her at the moment. Um, I was hoping maybe we could pick up some tracks here. So we'll have to carry on our search. But uh, 3.30 Central Africa time is your time. And Mark's going to be on camera again. Sebastian back in final control and I shall see you there. So take care and be ready for the next instalment installment of the Dunk Quiz. Bye everybody. Good morning everyone, Sebastian in Final Control. Well, yeah, the batteries are running low. It's uh, actually the first time that we have to stop so early, 20 minutes before the end of drive. But uh, when the inverter is beeping like this, we have to come back to base and put the batteries on charge. Otherwise, it's just going to get worse and worse. Uh, but it is getting a bit worried. They had the whole night to get charged and apparently that it wasn't enough. So I'm actually quite wor worried about this afternoon. But let's see. Um, I hope you all enjoyed the drive and well done to everyone for the dunk quiz and the track quiz. You did very well. I'm very impressed actually, uh, especially on the last one, the baboon track. And uh, that was not always easy and the light wasn't great on the track as well but uh, well done to the ones who, who got it right and uh, this afternoon Tara will be on drive and uh, Anton will be with her to show you how to cast tracks I think and uh, Mark will be behind the camera and I'll be here in FC so have a great day or a great evening depending on where you are in the world and uh, from myself and everyone here at Juma we uh, hope to see you a bit later, 3.30 Central African time for our live PM drive. Bye for now.